Hey everybody, Darren here with the Renaissance Coders. Today we're going to talk about C-sharp generics. So you've probably used generics if you're familiar with C-sharp. We define a generic class just like this. List int, int list is equal to a new list, type int. So we're using the list class from using system.collections.generic right here. And if you've ever used a list, then you've, you have used uh, generic classes. Maybe you've wondered exactly what it means to put uh, the integer value inside of the angle brackets. Or maybe you've wondered how you could create a class like that. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So the, the power of generics classes is that it lets you utilize multiple data types within that class. The tricky part is your class has to be able to uh, serve any data type uh, without knowing what kind of data type it's going to, to receive. So that's the tricky part. Let's go ahead and create a new generic class to uh, see what's involved. So I'm going to create a new c -sharp class and I'm going to call it number. And our number class is going to hold a value. So let's define some requirements. Our number class needs to hold a value and it needs to be, say it needs to be compared with other values. So we want to check for equality uh, of some manner. So maybe we can check for less than, greater than, or equal to with this number. So let's define the functions without generics to see what that's going to look like. And then what we'll do is add generics to the class and uh, see where our problems lie. So for our number class, we're going to have a value. And let's say that that value is an integer. So int number. And whenever we declare a new number, when we instantiate one, we'll pass it a value. So we're going to initialize it with some value. So we can say number is equal to num. Okay, so far so good. Now we want to be able to retrieve the value without modifying it. So we can create a property for this. We can say uh, public int value. And that's going to be equal, or not equal to, but that's going to be responsible for returning number. Okay, so we can retrieve it without modifying it. Uh, so, so far so good. Now what I want to be able to do is compare it with another value or another integer. So that's the goal right now. So we could say uh, public bool less than another integer. Uh, we can say we can just say num for this parameter name. That doesn't matter too much. So this should return true if our number is less than num. So what we'll do is say if uh, number is less than num, then return true. Simple enough. Otherwise, we can return false. Okay. Let's go back to our program and test this out. So we can create two numbers. Number one equal to new number that value is four and number and two is equal to new number we'll say that value is six okay so we want to say if n1 dot less than n2 then we can say console r since that uh, parameter is a value or that parameter is requesting an integer not a number so we have to say n2 dot value just like that. And uh, so if n1 is less than n2.value, we can say console.writeline. And we can say n1 is less than n2. So let's run this. Okay, we get n1 is less than n2, just like we expected. And now what we want to say is. Uh, you know, we want to make this generic. So this is what we want to work. We want to be able to say number int, just like we did with our list in the beginning of this video. We want to use these angle brackets to define uh, whether this is an integer. And just to make it more interesting, I suppose we could say uh, double. And this value would be 4 point, or can give it a new value entirely, 12.45. That would be that one. And then let's create a n2 in the same manner, also a double. 
and this one would be equal to something like uh, it doesn't really matter okay so we want to get rid of these red lines we want to make this possible so we want to make this work let's go back to number the number class and determine how we're going to make this generic well take a look at all of the instances of int and then what you do is you replace that with some arbitrary letter such as t so we can call this t this is going to be t this will be t and this will be t okay so all instances of int are now t but we're getting little red lines under these uh, the type of namespace t cannot be found uh, yeah t hasn't been defined yet the way we define t is by adding to the end of the number definition the class definition angle brackets with t so now t has been defined but uh oh we have another red line down here operator less than cannot be applied to the operands of type t and t so what does this actually mean in layman's terms what it means is the compiler doesn't know if number which is of type t it doesn't know if this type can be compared to another type t imagine our t was an elephant class so to emphasize this and now those lines go away so that worked so to emphasize my point here we could create a new class elephant right so we have a class called elephant we can actually pass that in here we can pass any type that we want to in here without any problems so if we do this uh, can elephant be compared to elephant can we say if elephant one is less than elephant two is that possible well of course not because we don't know if we can assign value to elephant we could be talking about the elephant's weight or the elephant's height and basically the compiler just doesn't know if those two data types can be compared in that way so this is where using generic classes gets really tricky now there is a way to make this work if we're using doubles I'm going to get rid of that elephant class because that's not necessary there's a way to do this and uh, the way is by putting constraints on our generic class so this is what a constraint looks like for generics we can say public class number t then we can say where t being our data type is constrained by so that's what the colon is can the colon is sort of like it inherits whatever we're going to put after it just like you might see in an, an inheritance uh, format so where t colon i comparable of type t so what this means is the i comparable class uh, or the i comparable interface must be implemented by t now that is the case for double uh, or int or float so since double is an i comparable that's going to work now how do we actually use i comparable that's the question so let's create a new function down here and we're going to call this uh, we'll say bool because it's going to return a bool we'll say compare this needs to take a t num and an int check we'll say check type so to understand what I'm doing, you need to understand what iComparable does for us and what it provides for us. What iComparable provides for us is the compare to function, which returns either negative one, zero. So let me put this in comments. Uh, or I'll, I'll put some captions up on the video. So uh, iComparable is going to give us a function called compare to, which returns negative one, zero, or one. And based on one of those three types of returns, that's going to tell us if the value is less than, equal to, or greater than uh, the compared value. So that's what this compare function is going to do for us. And what we're going to be comparing is number and num, since those are both of type T, which both use the iComparable interface. So hopefully this isn't getting too far ahead of ourselves and we can uh, follow along. So what we say here is if number.compareTo num is we'll say equal to check type so remember compare to is going to return uh, a value negative one zero or one all right now for less than that should be negative one if number is less than num then check type will be negative one so for this less than function we could say 
if if compare with num uh, negative one, that's the second parameter, then we return true. Otherwise, we return false. Okay, so that actually got rid of our uh, our error. Now, remember, num is the first parameter passed into compare. That's what we're actually comparing with our number value. And negative one is the check type. So if, if this is negative one, then that's going to, to let us know that we're checking to see if number is less than num. So that's the same thing as saying this right here. Okay, but we're going to use check type because we're actually going to use the same function uh, for checking greater than and e equal to. So if this is true, then we can return true. So this compare function is really just so we don't have to copy and paste uh, over and over again. Actually, we don't need to do this. We can just say return compare num negative one. So that's going to clean things up quite a bit for us. Okay, let's copy and paste this. Oops. Now copying and pasting in Xamarin Studio is a real pain because it adds hidden characters. Uh, I don't know if any of you use Xamarin Studio, but if you have that issue, let me know if you found a fix for that. So I'm actually not going to copy and paste because that is a real headache. I thought I would switch things up and use uh, Xamarin Studio because I always use Visual Studio Code or Sublime Text, but I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed with Xamarin Studio right now. So for greater than, we'll, we'll say return, compare, num, and one. So if this compared to function returns one, that means that number was greater than num. And that's the meaning of this. So you can kind of guess what uh, the equal to is going to look like. So equal to t num, we'll say return, compare num, zero. So if, if this function returns zero, that means that uh, num and number are equal to each other. Okay, and we're going to test this. Now before we test this, I wanna show you that uh, if we don't add this constraint on t, then we will get an error on compare to. Okay, so we have this error on compare to. Uh, T does not contain a definition for compared to and no extension method compared to. So let's bring this back. So why is that? Uh, that's because without this constraint, uh, our class doesn't know if T has the iComparable interface. By adding the constraint, the compiler knows that T must have the iComparable interface. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I can't talk. We know that T must have the iComparable interface. And actually, I, I want to test something. If we bring back that elephant class, it shouldn't actually let us do this because, okay, good. It doesn't let us use elephant because elephant doesn't implement iComparable. Um, so I can actually say iComparable here, and I might get an error in my elephant class. Okay, so. I'm not going to worry about doing that in this video. I'm getting off topic a little bit. Okay, so we wanna to test to see if uh, these functions actually worked for us. And keep in mind, we're using completely generics. Um, so let's say, let's just run this. This should give us the same exact value. Uh, we'll say n2 is less than n1. Okay, n1 is, or Okay, let me not do that. Let's add, uh, that's going to be confusing. Let's say else if n1, n1 dot greater than n2 dot value. And then else if n1 dot equal to n2 dot value. Okay, hopefully I should be fine copying and pasting one line. Shouldn't get any issues with that. Okay, so if n1 is greater than n2, then we wanna say n1 is greater than, and if n1 equals n2, we wanna say n1 is equal to n2. Okay, so let's run this again. So n1 is definitely greater than, so that should get returned for us. 
in one is greater than in two. Okay, let's make them the same value now. Say 6.24. Okay, it's probably not going to work with doubles because there's probably some hanging precision on these. Let's use integers. Uh, that's just one of the nuances with doubles. Um, there could be like 6.2400001 on one of these and not the other. Um, so let's, and I might be wrong about that, but these should definitely, oh, I see, I see what, okay. Sorry, I'm gonna go back. I see what I did. Um, the problem is I named this wrong. This should be n1.equal to, but I guess since it's an object type, we can actually run dot equals on anything. Okay, let's run this again. Okay, there we go. N1 is equal to N2, so that works. Uh, and let's just try one that's less than to make sure they all work. Okay, N1 is less than N2. Okay, perfect. So that is my summary on generics. Uh, we learned we learned quite a bit, actually. We, we learned how to put constraints on our generic data types, which is sort of a complex topic, uh, kind of hard to understand. We learned what sort of comparisons we could make with generics and which ones we couldn't and why that was. So if you have any additional questions about generics, leave them in the comment section. We might do another video on this if it gets a lot of likes and a lot of attention. Although I doubt it will because, you know, there isn't, there isn't a lot of need to use generics. But regardless, I hope that you learned what you came here to learn. And if you like the video, drop a like. But otherwise, I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks for watching. See you later.